it's the book. It's the book that's got to be what the book, what the magic it inspires in you. That'll never change. Around the mid-70s, a calendar started appearing with illustrations from the books, and that was basically uh, responding to the power of Tolkien in various artists' lives who started to see, like me, that this is you know, really interesting stuff to try and uh, capture. So I did, in the 70s, the most um, well-known of the calendars was by the Hildebrand brothers, and they, would, they did three in a row, 76, 77, and 78. And I was like, ah, that's what I want to do. <laughs> and they got it so wrong. Like, so many of their pictures are just, like, laughably inaccurate. Uh, like, they were more influenced by Disney than by Tolkien, it seemed like, you know. That was part of that uh, sort of new first wave of illustrators who were interested in Tolkien, doing it spontaneously, you know, not being commissioned at all, but just because they loved the books and were so passionate about them. By 1990, I had a full calendar of all my art, all the stuff that I'd been building up over those 20 years or so. And, uh, and my name started to become known by that point. There was a little blurb about uh, the Tolkien Society uh, in there, and I thought, okay, so there is a society. I had no idea, you know, this is before the internet. So it was a good move, and, and yeah, I met some great, one of my best friends I met uh, the first time I went to one of their meetings in, in Oxford, England. And that was part of the magic for me too, like, oh yeah, I'm going to go hang out people in England and became a second home for me, you know, it was just, it was great, uh, or just really welcoming and, and you know, like, you know, there's the costumes and everyone's just really into the whole thing and it's just really great to, to be among them, to be honoured and a lot of people are really glad to meet me and I'm so surprised and very humbled by uh, that kind of, you know, response and so it has paid huge dividends for me and why wouldn't I want to just keep doing this uh, as long as possible? In 1999, or I guess it was late, late 1998, I did hear from the producers of the films. Um, I knew they were going to uh, be making those films, and I'd heard about you know some of the other artists that I know. Um, like I'm considered, generally speaking, um, one of three top illustrators of Tolkien that have been most successful and have had the you know the greatest sort of success as far as fans. And that would be you know, John Howe and Alan Lee. Both of those guys were hired on to work on those films, um, and they spent, I don't know, two, three years maybe down in uh, Wellington, New Zealand, uh, doing that. Uh, so I was invited to do the same thing uh, around that time. And uh, I, I thought about it very carefully. It was a tough time in my life. I was uh, leaving the marriage, I was in uh, at the time, and um, and I wasn't comfortable with the idea of going all the way to a location that, like halfway around the world, at the best of times. You know, that's a pretty dislocating thing, literally. I know they probably, you know, without explicitly knowing this, my guess is Jackson, being very sensitive to fans and what they expected of his films, um, he was a bit nervous. You know, like like with Star Trek, are they gonna like? throw no no that's not Tolkien you, you blew it it's just like completely wrong so I think he was trying very hard on the Fellowship of the Ring especially to um, respect fans um, expectations and part of that is the look which myself John Howe Alan Lee and you know another two dozen illustrators easily have helped to establish through calendars through book covers through whatever you know has been, been made available up until then Apparently in the scene in Helm's Deep, they're the big battle scene, they had someone making ring mail, you know, like miles of miles of ring mail. Just these small group of people just hammering away like dwarves in a mine somewhere and just making, you know, chain mail. Unfortunately, you couldn't really see much of that under the leather over top of that and at night in the rain. But they, you know, hundreds of actors were wearing this, you know, real chain mail that was made for them. And it was like, it, you, you couldn't even see it. This is nuts. <laughs> Does, is there a sort of a handbook to films and, you know, you have to have some, like, dumb humor thing in there. And, you know, that is, it is Ian Tolkien. He, you know, he had a sense of humor. There was a whimsical stuff. The, the ends are kind of comical and other things like that. But it's still, it's just the way... Tolkien and Jackson approached them were not quite the same and, and uh, 
you know, so, but anyway, entertaining, I suppose the majority of people were happy with it, but he admitted, I'm catering this to the young generation, you know, the gamers and people that are, you know, have a different view of this stuff, and um, whereas adults who were more closer to J Tolkien's own generation saw a different sort of um, idea there. He yeah, just having done a couple of illustrations in high school, after having read the books, like, okay, I gotta, I just gotta do this stuff, and, you know. I did a, a, a picture of Bilbo, the dwarves, and Dan Gandalf in the meeting they had at the beginning of the book where they're looking at the map of Erebor and, you know, what's this going to be all about? Or, and I sent a photo of that to Tolkien as well, and then a few little drawings and things that I'd done as well by that time. So it was only the first year or so I'd, I'd been working on anything about Tolkien related. It was 1972, and so I sent to uh, him that stuff. He wrote back in a letter through his secretary, being that he was by this time getting a lot of fan mail and and things like phone calls in the middle of the night in England because people don't appreciate that the <laughs> he has a life and he's a professor but he doesn't really want to hear from you at the five in the morning and he did died the next year 1973 yeah so it was one of the last people to I guess uh, get a fan letter from him um, yeah and uh, that was just very very encouraging for me. Um, um, you know, as a young artist, and, um, and he did a little critique of one of my uh, my picture of Bilbo. He said it looked too much like a child. I thought, yeah, okay, yeah, I see that now. When I went back and read the description of hobbits, um, but it, that was that was a common problem for people. Like Hildebrand, same thing. They look like little kids. How could you ever really do a proper justice? And well, you can't really. And it's there's something to that. Um, a hobbit is half the size of an adult. And we're seeing the world through children's eyes in some ways uh, with the hobbits because they're very kind of guileless, you know, they don't understand the wider world and its evils and things. This is part of the theme of the book. It was in the context of what the ring represented, you know, why it would have power over a person. And of course, the, the mighty and the powerful and people like Gandalf would say, no, 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 don't give it to me because, <laughs> you know, I couldn't resist the need to try to save the vulnerable. That was what he would want to do, and of course it would ruin him. And it was, and Tolkien shows tremendous sophistication, even in that observation, right from the beginning of the book. This is why this thing is dangerous, and why we've got to do something about it. And what the last thing that anyone would expect would be this lowly hobbit to take it to where it was made and destroy it. That no one wanted to believe or could ever expect, and, uh, which is what gives the book such great, uh, you know, sort of you know, I don't know, narrative power. <laughs> Except the scheme of it, the uh, the unexpected person who becomes the uh, the carrier. Uh, the, there's a there's a chapter called the Council of Elrond, and all the you know Gandalf and Elrond and, and Boromir, Aragorn, and Gimli, and they're all kind of debating what to do about this ring, this this problem. And you know, sort of <laughs> finally Frodo. He's sort of getting, you know, the drift of where it's going. He stands up and he says, I will take the ring, though I know not the way. <laughs> I think that's what Tolkien had a very wonderful insight into, you know, that um, as a person who went through a war, you know, and realizing how overwhelming the powers are that uh, set up a thing like that, a, a conflict like that, and, and what can one person do, you know, but. Uh, I think you realize, well, as a writer, you can do something. Yeah, you can you can inspire people. Try to read.